Accessing library computer data. And to make sure history never forgets the name Enterprise. Hey everybody, welcome to the Penske Podcast. If you haven't tuned in before, this is a podcast where we're running through all 178 episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, giving our thoughts and feelings about each and every one. Right now we are up to episode 26 of season 5, season finale here. It's called Time's Arrow Part 1. It was directed by Les Landau. Teleplay goes to Joe Minoski and Michael Piller, and the story goes to Joe Minoski. It aired back on June 15th, 1992. In this one, they dig up Data's head from 500 years in the past, and then Data goes back in time and uh, meets Guinan in, you know, 19th century America. Guinan's just hanging out. It's the season finale for season five. We're almost through. Clay is here to talk about this one. So right after this, me and Clay are going to go deep on the time paradox of Time's Arrow. See ya. Interesting. There was a 12% decomposition of bitanium in the neural pathway links. That suggests that the alloys are vulnerable. Data, how can you look inside that? Analyze the decomposition without... Emotion, sir? Yes. I am simply trying to make an objective assessment. Data, is this yours? I believe so, sir. Could it be law? No, sir. My brother's positronic brain has a type L phase discriminating amplifier. Mine is a type R. Type R? Yes, sir. I was trying to think of the season finales. I don't know if this show does season finales fantastically. Uh, Best of Both Worlds is the obvious exception to that sort Mm -hmm. of rule. Uh, The first and second seasons didn't do anything. The second season ended with a clip show. Um, (laughs) So the first season just uh, was the neutral zone, which was terrible. Oof. Yowza. Third season had Best of Both Worlds. Fourth season uh, was Redemption. And that one was that was okay. Re- re- the first part of Redemption was okay. The second yeah. part was really good. Um, and now we're into Time's Arrow. And I think Time's Arrow is probably the second best season finale they've done. Part uh, one. We're only talking about part one here, I think. I don't know. You and I are going to have to have some words about this, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be interesting. I, uh, I rate this one highly just because of the way Picard says... Type R in the beginning when Data's explaining <laughs> the difference between him and Lore, which is one of my favorite uh, line rings. I I kind of like this episode, even though it it really strongly reminds me of City on the Edge of Forever. Very much so, yeah. Um, and I think I give it a lot of credit for just having maybe potentially the weirdest aliens that we've ever encountered. Mark Twain. Mark Twain, yeah, with the, that mustache, which is clearly uh, fake. Who is also Deep Throat from the X-Files. Oh, really? Yeah, he was on uh, Star Trek, uh, I think, in season two as uh, some other character. But yeah, he was uh, <laughs> Deep Throat from the X-Files. There we go. It all comes together in the early 90s, so the mid-90s. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think that uh, I think this episode is interesting. Uh, so you, you didn't particularly care for it, huh? Um, not really. As, as an inverse to the last episode, I was really on board for the beginning of it. But then I, it, I thought this it was really boring. I, it, I don't know. It just seemed like all the worst parts of Back to the Future Three. Sure, sure. At, w- at what point did you? Uh, what point did it lose you? Um, <laughs> pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> when when Data meets the uh, the snarky bellboy, I was kind of like, oh boy. Yeah, it, it's um, definitely got one of those things going on. It's it's amazing how close it is to City on the Edge of for, like they. He, they both episodes have them rent a hotel room and build something yeah. that will yeah. that will solve oh, the yeah, problem. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, good point. It's it's that's very weird. odd. It's very odd. Yeah, and uh, so I don't know if we want to get into this right now, but just like the, uh, I wasn't actively comparing those in my head because uh, that's no way to to watch it because that other episode is such a classic. Yep. But uh, I don't know. It just seemed like there was no. By the time you get to the end of this episode, the stakes involved aren't really interesting to me. Sure. Um, you know, where in City on the Edge of Ter- City on the Edge of Forever, the stakes are very specific, and 
very very small but also very large um you know because the uh, Kirk kind of falls in love with this woman but he knows she's going to die but she has to die because if she doesn't die then Hitler wins rules the, world. the world or yeah. something yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's kind of it's kind of a um uh, the consequences are rather rather large uh this one i don't know aliens with face holes in their brain foreheads that are sucking energy out of I don't know it just the I think showing those aliens was the worst mistake they could have made yep um I think when data is walking around explaining what he's seeing is kind of creepy oh that shit was great I love that yeah, that yeah. was uh, I was totally on board then because like it was the stuff that he was describing as I pictured it in my head was so much more interesting than the way it looked when they <laughs> right. showed it as it yep. usually goes. Yeah. But no, when he's, he was talking about that stuff, I was like, wow, he just walked into like a Hunter S Thompson acid trip or something, or like naked lunch or something. That shit is weird. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then they show them and it's like, Oh, paper mache guys with punches, punch holes in their foreheads. Yep. Sitting just, around. Yeah. Just wasn't doing it. This one uh, reminded me a little bit of, there's a Michael Crichton book that I think he wrote after this. Uh, it's called Timeline or something. There was a movie about mm-hmm, it. It's mm-hmm. the one where they go back in time to like the Middle Ages or whatever. Oh, yeah. I um, never saw it, but I remember the trailers very vividly. Yeah, the, bu- the book was not good. I'm sure the movie was shit. But um, it has a great opening hook, which is... I'm going to get this all wrong, but it, it, it stuck with me about how good of an opening hook it was, where a group of like scientists are doing research about time travel Mm -hmm. and they're doing it in like an archaeological site for some reason Mm -hmm. and so one day they all go in there and the head professor is just missing um they can't find him and then they start digging through the archaeological site and they pull out this chest and or something and inside it is a note that's signed by the guy that just says help me Mm -hmm. so he, he went back in time to that and left this note obviously for them to find in the future yeah, and yeah. Th- and then of course the the rest of the cast has to go back in time to rescue the professor, but right. it, it reminded me of that. Um, also, Back to the Future Three. Yes, and, and also, so it's a very common <clears throat> idea. Um, I mean, it's a good one. I mean, it's you know, uh, um, I think, I think I like the the beginning of this. I think this one has a little bit more pop to it because. I am I'm a big fan of the idea of playing with um, these fixed timeline things where it's like, well, now that you, you've here's something that clearly has happened to you in the future. And now that you've seen it, it means that it will happen. Sure. And that stuff gets really interesting. And uh, and it also sets up really good conversation on the ship about data, about what the the nature of being human is. Yep. And his. uh you know, him actually being comforted by the by knowing that he's eventually going to die. Right. It's, it's yeah. all that's all really interesting stuff. I I, I thought well, I, just to tie into yeah, to tie into that, I I thought I really enjoy. That's probably the strongest part of the episode for me. Down to mm-hmm. you know Picard not allowing Data to go on the away mission just because right. he doesn't know what's going to happen to him. Right. Um, it's funny to me, and it it made Nemesis feel a little bit worse where data's potential death is treated better in this episode than his actual death is in star trek nemesis which is <laughs> which is funny to me that we spend more time in this episode sort of thinking about him dying than the like 30 second thing we get at the end of that movie where they discuss the fact that he's dead right <laughs> um, well what, what, what would have made it better though is if at the end of nemesis when the ship blows up after the credits you see this little tiny speck flying away from the wreckage that goes to earth and just bounces its way into that cavern and it's his head. <laughs> it's his head, right. I mean, it would, have, it would have tied everything up in a neat bow. Um, yeah, it, and I can't think of the uh, other time travel. Does it make sense that both heads are in this timeline at this point? Is that... Oh, oh, that's a good question. I, I, was, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't think if that made sense or didn't make sense. Yeah. Yes, I think it does. <laughs> well, yeah, because because uh, well, his head needs. Well, to- first of all, time travel does exist. <laughs> That's right. So all of the mental energy that we're expending here is completely for for uh, good reasons. It's hard science. 
Um, but no, I guess technically it would because if you're going because if the the pivot point in the timeline is yesterday's enterprise, you're going back before that, and yesterday's enterprise is the the event that. Is that what you're making reference to? Oh, I, I didn't even think about how that would have adjusted things. I guess that could be true. If he, if the head goes back before yesterday's Enterprise mm-hmm. in, in the original timeline, and then yesterday's Enterprise affects that somehow, could the, the other universe's head still be shot into this universe? Is that is that what we're talking about? I guess uh, that's the kind of way I'm working around this. Well, I guess I'm thinking if, if yesterday's Enterprise and everyone listening has fallen asleep, <laughs> uh, if yesterday's <laughs> Enterprise is the point where the timeline splits, mm-hmm. then going back before that, you're going back to the uh, the um, like the original. original original timeline. Sure. So you're not there's no alternate past for the split timeline. You know what I mean? Sure. I'm, so yeah, yeah, or or not? I don't know. No, sure. I'm I'm thinking about it as <laughs> this date is ahead went back to pre yesterday's Enterprise, right? Right. So when that split happened, we're in a new universe where Data's head can simultaneously exist in two two places at once. I, like that's that's the way I'm gonna that's the way sure, I'm going to appreciate this one. You know what? That makes about as much sense as anything I said. So <laughs> and is equally as uh, as relevant and applicable. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, Data goes back into uh, back in time. Here he becomes a a poker player. He makes a lot of money. Uh, no one is really uh, suspicious of him at all, which is very interesting. Yeah, that's the other thing. I like. I don't know. Like, I get really tired of that. Sh- it was funny. It was funny in uh, you know Star Trek Four. When they're like, "Oh, Spock! Oh, he's you know he's he's a hippie, so that's why he's dressed that way." You know, th- they can get around some of that stuff, but like, when these people are just being like, "Oh, that pasty white guy who's speaking weird, he's French." He's French, yeah. It's a, it's a good know. running joke. Yeah, I get that stuff bores me pretty pretty quickly. And why couldn't they just have Brent Spiner say that line in French? Would have been, would it have been that difficult for him to say? It? They dubbed it over for some reason. I didn't understand that. Oh, is it dubbed? Yeah, it's definitely dubbed. Oh, I didn't notice that. Yeah, and just, I mean, Interesting. I, I do think that the the episode has Data's sort of adventure in the past is the least interesting aspect of it to me, um, just because he doesn't really run into any kind of conflict while he's there. Like the poker game, he just cleans exactly, the table yeah. with him. Yeah, uh, the bellhop brings him everything. Yep. And I keep thinking, I don't know if it's a modern approach to TV. I keep expecting the bellhop to betray him. And I, I, yeah, I don't definitely. remember if that's how this episode wraps up because I haven't watched Time's Arrow in a long, long time. Um, but I keep expecting things to go bad for Data, which obviously his head gets severed somehow. But um, this episode just didn't hint at any of that. It was just very very smooth sailing for him. Uh, right. Riker seems to be taking Data's potential death very hard. He's, he's yeah. very distraught by this, uh, thinking about it. When I really... Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I really like that scene because the way they're talking about it was like everybody on the ship seemed to know that they found Data's head in a 500-year-old cave. Why does everybody know that? It's, do you think, do you, don't you think you should keep that on, on the DL just tr- in case? Trend, it's trending on Reddit. It's like the top topic. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was amazed at the, uh, the dramatic flair of the first archaeologist who, just, who lets that slow build go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> before he before he reveals what the actual thing he found was, we found a gun and a watch. And if you step this way to this uh, blanket I've laid out, you'll find... how did that get there? Hmm. I wonder what's under it. <laughs> yeah, he was he was definitely very uh, dramatic in how he he approached things. Also, I mean, I, I don't know if that stuff was posit. No, because he said they tried to keep it the way that they found it. But yeah, it they was just yeah. there's just something really funny about. This idea that you crack open a 500-year-old cave and there's just stuff neatly laid out on a box. Yeah, yeah. And, like, you know, here's a gun and a watch just neatly sitting on top of a box that has not been... Not rotted. You know, yeah, not rotted or ruined or, or nothing has fallen off the ceiling and smat, you know. And then over here is a very comp- nicely placed head. Although uh, Worf drops the line, if anyone else's bones were in there, they would have disintegrated by now, which I don't know if that's true. Um, I would think that the future they'd be able to find that, but yeah, that's the big mystery. If if everyone else is actually in that cave with Data, which uh, knowing that we have two seasons of TNG left, probably seems unlikely at this point. I was hoping a little bit more um, 
for it to little to get a little bit more Philip K. Dicky, if that makes sense. Sure. Uh, like I was kind of hoping that, and maybe the, I'm sure this stuff probably comes in later. I I, th- I remember watching this episode fairly recently. I think the last time I went through, I think I watched these two, because as soon as they stepped into that cave, I got like a, a deja vu thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I it would have been nice if they had dropped a couple of those elements into the story. So like so I guess I'm thinking of the Philip K. Dick uh, story uh, payback. Where the guy, uh, he, he wakes up, he's got no memory, and he gets a manila envelope full of, uh, like, there's a key card. Right. And, you know, he has to figure out what the key card goes, that kind of thing. So you've got, like, four or five elements that are potentially elements that lead up to your death, right? Sure. And so somewhere along the line, the watch shows up or the gun shows up or th- that kind of thing. I'm sure that, I, I assume that must happen in the second half. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, but, I, I don't remember, but I mean, that would, although... I don't know. I, don't, I mean, that would be good writing if it actually showed up. I don't know if that's what's going to actually happen here. Yeah. Just because just that stuff, like, it, at least, you know, if you're dealing with, maybe I'm th- this is from watching too much Doctor Who, but if you're dealing with this idea of there's a fixed point in time, that the, a fixed point in time that ha- that is clearly your own death, um, and the harbingers of this fixed point are these certain elements there's this idea that you could swerve away from this fixed point until you start seeing all of these pieces that are falling into place to get you there, you know? Right, exactly. Um, you can't cheat fate, as yeah, they, kind, uh, they say kind of, Yeah, kind of like... Uh, uh, well, never mind. I was going to say kind of like the glass breaking in, in cause and effect, but that's a different idea. But. R- yeah, yeah. But, uh, uh, sort of along the similar line, but it's not, not the exact idea. I mean... So I yeah I mean with the, with this episode I, I would I would agree that I would have liked to have if they had laid out clues that the past were using to solve what's going to happen would have been interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, they I don't think they're going to do that. So and or even or even like you know I don't think data is I can't remember is data in the cave when they find the head. He is yeah right? he is he's in the opening. Well, it would have been interesting if maybe he hadn't been there, so he doesn't know what those elements are, but the people watching do. So, like, let's say, um, you know, when he goes back in time at the poker at the poker game, one of the things he wins is that watch, right? You know, so yeah, he's got okay, oh, that's yeah, one of yeah. the elements that that are putting him on the path to eventually getting his head cut. I see. Yeah, that would that would be a much more that would have been an interesting way to do the second half of this episode. Uh, yeah, they don't, they don't do anything like that, unfortunately. <laughs> Great. Um, I don't I don't think so. Or even you know, like thinking of one that they could tie in was Data gives away his communicator in this episode. Yep. Like if they mm-hmm. if they had found that somewhere else in the archaeology uh, the sites or something. Mm, yeah. Uh, yeah, that would have worked. But no, they they don't do anything like that, um, which is really too bad. So let's talk about. Uh, Guinan and her lack of caring about altering timelines, <laughs> which I guess you learned your lesson from yesterday's Enterprise, is that it's better to alter the timeline if you need to. I guess, yeah. I'm. Uh, She's I, yeah. I, I don't know. I do, does. I assume she probably plays into the resolution of of whatever. But yeah, I guess she she has no qualms whatsoever about about helping uh helping data why do you think uh Guinan's on earth um i, 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 I do like the way that uh whoopi goldberg Wine. i do like the way whoopi goldberg uh plays her differently mm-hmm. she's much mm-hmm. more sort of like uh impish i guess would be the way to describe her when she's uh, when she's younger a little bit more sort of sarcastic um and they they pair that off nicely against the scene where she's obviously just settled into being a bartender um, at 500 years in the future. Right, right. Um, it's. I think it's clever. I don't. I don't know why. What is she doing? Is she hosting a literary event or something? I didn't understand what the newspaper was telling me. I. Th- I did not read it super closely, but for some reason I thought she was like a, a celebrated writer. But I could be wrong. Oh, okay. <clears throat> I could be completely wrong. But yeah, she may have just been hosting a party or something. Yeah, but- just like sort of a. Uh, a, a rich, uh, how like a rich sort of um, what a patron of the arts, I guess, would be maybe yeah, the way that yeah. she would be. So yeah, this is the first uh, the first time we've learned that she has lived for hundreds of years. I guess we knew mm-hmm. that she was old, but this is our first uh, clue that she's very, very old, and she's actually visited Earth and met Picard, and Picard does not remember it. 
for some when reason. When does he meet? She meet Picard. I forget. In this episode or in uh, what are you referencing right now when you say she's met Picard? Well, she, she's uh, she's obviously met she because Picard is going in back in time, right? Oh, right. Okay. So yeah. they're they're obviously going to meet. Right. And Picard is not going to remember it. Right. In the future, I don't gotcha. remember how that actually pans out. So <laughs> I don't know why. In the era that this show was on, both syndicated shows, both dealing with people living for a long time, why did the character of Guinan not show up on Highlander? Mm -hmm. That would have been awesome. Would have been for for only me. (laughs) I think that would have been a sizable portion of the uh, population (laughs) that would have enjoyed it. I just, I really, uh, one of the things about the rewatch is I just really learned how much I enjoy the Guinan character. Yeah, yeah. I always, I always wrote her off when I was younger because you know she wasn't part of the crew. But uh, uh, she's great. She's really, really good. It's just it's well acted. It's well written, or at least her acting sort of covers up the writing enough to a point where it seems well written. Yeah. Um, and she just they keep her mysterious. I'm surprised at their restraint to not explain her. I guess. Yes. Yeah. Which is greatly appreciated right yeah because i i feel like if i feel with some of the scripts that come out the writers on the show at a certain point you know when you're when you're in episode 25 of season five you must just be like i have an episode about guinan like let's learn about guinan like right. you know you just you're yeah. hitting that point where you just got to start looking for things and yeah you got to fight fight the urge like i mean that's what it, it happens to everyone eventually like uh you know uh in in comics Wolverine, his whole thing was that nobody knew what his name was. He couldn't remember his past because he had all these memory implants and nobody knew anything about him. But then eventually, because they need to sell books, they eventually tell you what his name is and what his history is. And that's just, you know, right. gives a shit. And then They're doing the same thing with the Joker. They're talking about telling you who the Joker is. Eh, eh, it's not interesting. Right, yeah. Well, that's never then eventually... the answer. The answer is never in- as interesting as it was before they told you. Right, yeah, yeah. It, uh, it, yeah, it changes everything. Eventually, you'll get to a point where they have to give him a, a previous identity to the identity that they've already told you about just because you need to keep pushing it back. You know what I mean? Right, like, right. You know, we, he was actually, he had another life before that happened. He was this guy. Well, what, not to go completely off topic here, but what was the best thing about Wolverine was that he, th- this uh, <laughs> this memory implant thing that they worked in to make it, to basically uh, write out all of these other stories they told about him. Yep. Um, it was great because then whoever was writing the book could could make any crazy connections they wanted. It was like, oh, well, Sabretooth and Wolverine might be father and son. Nope, memory implant. Right. Uh, Sabretooth and Wolverine met each other in World, World War II. Nope, memory implant. So you could go <laughs> anywhere you wanted, and it could be as crazy as you wanted it to be, but it never stuck because it, you would always wonder which one of those things was actually the true the true story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a great uh, it's a great big eraser on a pencil, I guess. You just like, oh, well, yeah. that was that was good, but now let's just get rid of it. Yeah, I'm surprised that they. Maybe it's it might. I mean, it might just be her lack of availability. You know, she's not what, on every episode and things like what that. What would you do if? Well, how would you react if the new Star Trek series, the first season, was just twelve episodes about Guinan? I I would be so torn. I would be like, wow, it's, a, <laughs> it's amazing that they went with that character. However, what a terrible character to choose. Yeah. Um, yeah, like. I don't know. I I like I uh, when I was growing up. I liked um, this role playing game for PlayStation called Suikoden, and yeah. what the thing was, you'd basically it was like this you know fantasy typical fantasy type thing where you, you'd recruit these hundred and eight people who were like the stars of destiny, and when you assemble them, you're allowed to sort of win, beat the world, or whatever. It was a series of games. So over the course of the games, you'd see previous stars of destiny come back into the new game. With like oh, cool. a new set of characters, and so mm-hmm. you you'd have this built-in history of these previous characters that you're familiar with mixed in with new people, and it's always just I, I I don't know, it's a very sensitive line as to how far is too much of the old people. Like right, worst case right. scenario would be we mentioned it before, but like ending Enterprise with a holodeck episode about <laughs> Will Riker is way too much next gen. But seeing seeing a little clip or something or they, they did it well with the data because data plays all of the soon characters. Right. So you can have old soon characters played by Spiner and it makes sense. Right. So it's just kind of, 
it'd be tough in the the new series. I'm, I guess what I'm saying is I have no idea how much or how little I want old lore to be a part of it, I guess. Right. I You know, the thing I was thinking is, I think at the very least, I think Picard has to show up in some form once. Sure. Because I feel like Picard never got his final episode. Well, no, I guess the finale is pretty good at that. Never mind. I take it back. Well, I mean, we're we're just assuming that this p- takes place before. Uh, yeah. Or well, I mean, show. if they're changing, if they're changing stories every every season, who? You know, oh, sure, if, sure. It could take place in the future. I don't know. I just feel like that Picard never got the. I mean, I, I don't know. It's tough to say this, I guess, because that f- season, f- the series finale, is so damn good. Yep. Um, but it would be fun to see like one more uh, generations type episode with Picard in it that hopefully doesn't end with him getting crushed by a rock. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, yeah, it would, it's uh, thematically relevant. Or yeah, if I, not, if not him, maybe Riker or something. Like someone, it seems. I feel like someone from TNG needs that kind of episode where you just like, all right, that's the period at the end of the sentence. Yes. I mean, when we get to it, I think that. Uh, I mentioned it, yeah. Ne- like I mentioned, Data's death feeling unsatisfying in Nemesis, right? Like when we get to it, my problem with Nemesis is that it doesn't. Like they knew it was going to be the final Next Generation movie, you know. Okay. Like so, why does it not feel like it's the final story? Yeah, that's a good point. I know. I, I, I know that the, you know the 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 posters all say a generation's final journey, but the story has nothing to do with that at all. Right, and I remember I watched it not too long ago, maybe a year, year or two ago, and I uh, um, remember feeling the same way, where it was like, well, this doesn't really, I mean, this just feels like another another story. There's no sense of finality to it at all. Right, it, it just in the final five minutes, they're like, well, Data's dead, and Riker and Troy are going off on their own ship, so I guess this is pretty much the end of an era, but it, it feels so unsatisfying that that's the way that everything is going to break down. Yeah, definitely. So I, I agree that, I feel the next generation cast never got that final send off, which an episode could uh, potentially, you know, sort of uh, not retcon, but sort of work into a new series somehow. Either you do it in the past or you do it somehow in the future. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so back to the hell we talk about. We're talking about Time Zero. So Data's in the past. Uh, <laughs> Rik- Riker, Riker, and everyone beam down to the cave planet. And they, uh, Picard goes down as well. Guinan tells him that he must go to the past or they will never meet. Yeah. Picard joins them. Uh, they go down and they sort of walk into the, the light and then that's it. Um, yeah. Would you, so you, you didn't enjoy this one as a season ender, I, I guess. No, no, I thought it was a terrible season ender personally. I, uh, I don't know. It just like, there was no... So, okay, for instance, um, when they explained what was going on, like when they were bringing back those little cartridges that were feeding into that machine, yep. or that little rock machine. Can you explain what, the, what uh, are, the, are those aliens the Davidians? What, what are they talking about with the snake? The what, what branch, is, what is branch the, Davidians? The branch Davidians are bringing guns into there. Um, what, is, what is the snake? Is the snake and the weapon that they're using, and they see it as? Why does Data know that he's looking for a snake? Well, I think that I, I think the thing is that Data saw basically what we see at the end, before he goes into the, uh, uh, he gets sucked into the, the time light. portal. Yep, yep. And I, I thought that the snake staff was uh, um, what opened up the time portal. Okay. So that's why he was looking for the guy on Earth, is so he could open the time portal i could be wrong but that's how i took it okay that Um, that makes more sense to me i i I thought i yeah i was confused i thought he had seen because when you see the aliens in san francisco they don't have the snake they just have that like gun that they shoot the the alcoholic with which is way more inconspicuous (laughs) (laughs) no one cares about these bums he's they're carrying like a giant death ray (laughs) But if they had just kept their cool-looking snake staff, that would be like, oh, that's an eccentric gentleman from the 1800s. Probably from France. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, so I guess I understand that. And are the aliens that are walking in and out, they're the same aliens as the ones that are sitting in that room? I Yes, I believe so. Okay. So the thing that, that got me confused for a second, which <laughs> I thought was going to be a little bit more cooler until I realized what they were doing. Sure. Um, 
I thought what they were seeing was because because Troy uh, was getting those those vision. Good use of Troy in this episode, actually. By yes, the way. yes, it actually was. Yeah. Um, she was getting those feelings, and uh, they were talking about why they couldn't see each other um, when they were on the same phase, yep. whatever. Yep. And uh, Troy made a statement for a second that I thought meant that what they were seeing was the ghosts of a, a, a race that had been wiped out. Sure. Which, which I thought, oh, that's really cool. It made me think of uh, um, Prometheus. That was one of the one of the things I, I liked about that movie is that like sort of uh, uh, video basically that played that showed the <laughs> that, yeah. the la- the you know basically like a surveillance video of the last few minutes of this species life or whatever. Right. I thought that was kind of interesting, but then I was like, oh, that's not it's what she's sensing is the life force of the humans that are being brought back in their little you know yeah their tupper, they're, Tupperware container right so they're they're feeding tube or whatever yeah. that is so and. And I thought, yeah, I don't know. I thought that was kind of, yeah, whatever. Um, I forgot the question. Well, I mean, I, I guess, <laughs> I guess that. So the aliens are just bringing them back and feeding human souls. These, they're basically right. human souls yes. to yeah. these other aliens. Yes. Um, and I guess when the crew goes back into that area where they can see them, they're somehow on like a different time plane so they aren't there at the same time but they can see them i guess and going through the portal brings them 500 years in the past for whatever reason right um yeah it's I, if anything this episode is interesting to me just because i don't remember how it resolves i don't remember if they do a good job of tying this into some historical event where people being killed would make sense you know what i mean right um well they did say there's a cholera outbreak oh that's true are they blaming the cholera on on cuz that guy was coughing right that was the yeah they they haven't i don't think they didn't directly do that in the episode but i think maybe they're um using that as some sort of uh cover cover story i see interesting huh well i mean it's the it's the end of season 5 they 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 wrapped it up with uh <laughs> with this this script which yeah i, I was just going to say like the thing you're ending your season and the last shot of the season is the crew of your ship casually walking into a big light portal. Yeah, yeah. I, it yeah. was just so boring, and you know, I, I'm not saying that every every cliff every season ender has to be you know uh, a dolly a pivoting dolly shot to Riker's face when he talks about blowing up the captain. Right. But, you know, it's got to have a little bit of zip to it. I think that a um, something you should strive for. <laughs> they should have just. If they should have just blacked the screen out and had a gunshot. That would have been way more, way more interesting. <laughs> they wake up with Mr. Body laying on the floor in between them. Like, what happened here? Yeah, I think that's something to aim for in a a cliffhanger is you want the episode to end in a way where you don't have a couple minutes to realize that the show is running out of time. Yes. Like, yeah. uh, so Best of Both Worlds does that really well because it ends on just the like this is going to be the moment that decides everything and then it cuts to right. black and you're like oh god damn it and this one they spend like 5 minutes looking at the glowing lights and you're like all right as soon as they go into this like this this after the season is over it's just kind of disappointing to end it in such a right. way that it doesn't feel very exciting yeah you want you want a, a cliffhanger where you check the time on the episode and then there's like 5 minutes left and you go how the hell are they going to finish this episode right. with five minutes left? Yep. Not an episode like this where, personally, I felt this way, where you're like, wow, they they just did five minutes of data building machine and talking to a bellboy. Yeah, yeah. Clearly, they don't have anything else to do. <laughs> <laughs> the story's over. Bring him back. He'll be fine. Yeah, it's it's too bad. I, I enjoyed this. I mean... Uh, yeah, we'll we'll just go to final thoughts. We'll wrap it up, and then we'll give uh, final thoughts about this one, and sort of I'll give a little bit of light final thoughts about season five in general. So I'm going to play a clip from Time's Arrow. We'll see you in a bit. What exactly are you? Android. Artificial life form. Uh, did my father send you here? Because if he did, you must go back and tell him I've not done listening to I everything. was not sent by your father. Circumstances demand that I take you into my confidence. I require your assistance. Sorry. I am from the 24th century, where you and I serve aboard a starship. And? 
Our ship encountered a species who appears to be threatening 19th century Earth. I investigated and was inadvertently pulled into their temporal vortex. When I saw your photograph in the newspaper, I assumed you had joined me from the future, from the Enterprise. I knew your species was long lived, but I did not realize you had visited Earth so long ago. Uh, eavesdropping is by no means a proper activity for a gentleman. Nonetheless, the deed is done. Time Zero. We're here with our final thoughts. So, guys, as I mentioned in the previous video, if you're on YouTube, uh, mobile, or the actual internet, you can click up on the right upper hand corner of the video. There'll be a little gray circle with an I in it. If you click that, it'll open up a poll where you can vote for where you would rank this one on our scale of one to five. So you can take a second to do that right now. And we're going to let you know what we thought about Time Zero. You went first last time, so I guess I'll go first uh, this time. Well, I, I just wanted to point out to everybody. Um, Similarly to what I said about the last episode, this episode's very close to your heart because I believe in your your wedding vows. You said uh, that your sensory input has become accustomed <laughs> to the response of Amy's face. I think, right? <laughs> if I remember correctly, yeah, her mother was very upset with me. Um, <laughs> that scene made me laugh just because you can tell that was a. Uh, it was one that obviously took a long time to shoot because if you watch. Um, Sirtis's face that moment when Riker delivers that line mm -hmm. she does the actor thing of sort of going dead inside to not laugh at how ridiculous <laughs> like everything is so she just if you watch her she she just kind of puts like that 50 yard gaze on and just stares at nothing until the mm -hmm. scene is over and then it's like mm -hmm. okay that's it but yeah the uh the memory implants are growing uh growing distant or whatever data says is a friendship <laughs> i really i like that sort of stuff about the data uh aspects of this one early on his no that all that stuff is great yeah yeah it's just him going into the past is not particularly exciting it's uh yeah i know it's a chance for the the crew to play or the cast to play dress up and all that stuff that's usually what these episodes are that's that's exact. i was talking to sean about this before we started that's exactly what he said he's like unfortunately the cast gets really excited about the opportunity to play other characters, regardless of how good the script is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, that's all going to happen in the second part of this one. But to this one, I think this, I, I think this, I still stick to my point. I think this is the second best uh, season ender they ever did. I think this episode is better than redemption. Part one. Um, redemption. Part two is very good, but I think that, this one is, you know, out of out of all of them, outside of Best of Both Worlds, which is Leagues Ahead, this one is decent, a de pretty decent season ender. It sort of fits the tone of season five. Uh, everything mm -hmm. kind of makes sense. Like the the personality of the characters is coming through and the storytelling. It it does meander way too much once Data goes back into the past. Um, but I think that the concept behind it is actually kind of neat. I even like the soul-sucking aliens, even though looking at them is not quite as cool as their actual concept. <laughs> Um, I'm going to give it a three. I think it's like a strong three, and I'll, I'll go with that. So what are you going to give this guy? Uh, I'm going to go with a two. Sure. Yeah, I don't know. It's just... <clears throat> I feel like at this point, they should be better at this. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, uh, I don't know. It's weird. I feel like, I feel like this was not a, um, isolated occurrence to shows in the 90s that were particularly good shows like when i went back and i watched through the x-files the x-files out of all what nine seasons has maybe two maybe three season finales that are really good yeah um and especially two parters when they do the two parters sometimes they're not great and you know generally they they the season enders and the season starters are where a lot of these shows fall for some reason which is really strange to me like uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer was the same way. She, that show had very few good. They had better finales than they did starts, but they had very few season starts that were really solid. Yeah, I, th um, I, I sort of wonder if it's a, um, if it's a sort of byproduct of the fact that this is from an era where people had to watch the show live. Yeah, I wonder if shows were like you know people might just not be aware that the season is starting. So let's not put the really good stuff first. You know what I mean? 
Okay, interesting. So, like, nowadays you need that first good episode because you stream everything, so you need that hook immediately. Right. And I, I just wonder if back then they were like, well, let's let people give, give, give them two weeks to realize that the show has actually started up again, and then we'll give them the good stuff. That's interesting. Excuse me. Sure. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> I'm write that down so I can cut that out. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I never really thought about that before. Um because I know definitely they have their, uh, I don't know how much of it's still a thing now, but their, the sweeps weeks in November and February used to be like the time where they would hit you with the really good stuff. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I, I never really thought about the idea of, <laughs> they, you know, let, let's, let's, it's like when you're, when you're, uh, um, when you're packing for like a road trip. Yep. And it's like, you know what? Let's just get out the door. And we'll deal with some of this stuff once we're on the road. I'll buy it at the Kmart down the street. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Not- so we forgot flip flops. We don't have time to turn. Oh, we just got to get on the road. We're already ten minutes late. Right. There's four WalMarts between here and Poughkeepsie, so we'll be fine. Because I mean, the the running, like if you read about show production notes, the the start of a season is like the only time that the production team is actually somewhat ahead of schedule. You know, because they've had a couple yeah. weeks to get into it. So yeah. it's not like it's a, a thing where they're just like, we just need an episode. They they they're they're carefully choosing what episodes go first i think yeah what's well, uh it's interesting uh i know that the simpsons the first episode that they would write every season would be the treehouse of horror episodes sure be- even though that those those came you know uh, over a month into the season because they were the hardest ones to write oh so really they would, yeah they would start with those and then that they would you know because of the various all new sets and all new stuff that they had to draw and design. Those would be the hardest ones to write and the hardest ones to animate and draw. So they would start with those. Just get them um, out of the way. Yeah. Yeah, I could almost see the other way that they, um, I would have thought that they might be easier because at least they have like a formula that you know what to do with. You know, you take like a, the template is sort of laid out for you. You have to make like a right. parody of something or do something right, like that. Right. But right. I, I could see it being the other way too where it's a lot more, uh, you might actually need to be more creative just to come up with something that you can satirize or whatever or parody. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Anyway, that's it for season five of Star Trek: The Next Generation. We made it. We're on to season six. Season five. Uh, I'm gonna have a wrap up video with general thoughts, but it's been it's been an interesting season to just sort of go through, and it ties into your uh, mention about the X Files the start and stop. I mean. One of the things I've learned from just going through this is there was a, there's a lot of just there's a lot of mediocre episodes. You know, yeah. there's there's so many episodes of this show. I tweeted recently. Um, I'm only through season five of one series, and there were like there's like five other Star Trek series. Oh yeah, you know, like there's there's just an absurd amount of Star Trek out there. Um, oh yeah, and you know I I still I clearly love the show. I would have stopped doing the podcast, but. It's just it's very eye opening to actually delve deep into something and realize what's actually there <clears throat> when you consider all of it at the same time. Yeah, it's um <clears throat> it's it's interesting going back and looking at this stuff, especially specifically a show like Star Trek, which was which was a uh, um, syndicated show to begin with that there's so much you you never had the uh, ability to do what we're doing now where you can sit down and start at the beginning and go to the end yeah that i mean star trek to me was always the show that you watched when you remember that it was on yes yeah and um so yeah sitting down and actually and, and by that token you never really at least i never really took in exactly how many episodes were in a season <laughs> right yeah you know yeah. what where the season breaks even were uh, um, you know, I mean, there's a there's a good chance when I watched Best of Both Worlds for the first time, it was in rerun, and they might have played the two episodes back to back or something. I don't know. Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. Or or maybe the next day or something. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it's interesting going back and watching these shows in a way that they were never really meant to be watched, <laughs> <laughs> right? And then criticizing them for it, be like, you, yeah. these fucking scumbags didn't write this thing. These probably. guys, these guys who spent seven or eight years of their lives working their asses off <laughs> t- so you could have a goddamn space show on television for an hour every week oh. ruined ruined marriages thrown out shoulders yep now it's- we're giving them shit because their pacing was off <laughs> for two episodes in a row unacceptable <laughs> i had to i had to watch all this yeah it's i i just think it's um it's fascinating and it'll be 
it's I'm just I'm very interested just talking about the new Star Trek series, how you modernize the series, because I I am somewhat concerned about the fact of how how much of what the show is is tied up into this concept of this was how it was made. You know what I mean? And I can I can see you take the universe and change it and make it more modern. But I don't know. You know, diehard fans are going to hate it no matter what. Uh, so you just well, ignore diehard their fans are generally have different opinions than Star Trek fans anyway. So yes, yeah, right. Well, that's true. There's no Bruce Willis in. Uh, There's in this. very little overlap. <laughs> so, yippee, yippee, ki yay, motherfucker, will be the the tagline for the new Star Trek. I just yeah, it it, it will be interesting because uh, it is. I mean, more so than. Um, well, I mean, if you look at what they did with the X Files. They brought the X Files back, and the, the episodes that really worked weren't the ones that they modernized. Sure, um, the ones that they tried to modernize were com- were total garbage. Right, <laughs> yeah. but the ones where they just you know fell back on the formula of what worked, those episodes were really solid. So yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see uh, how they handle it in a post Breaking Bad world. Which would be you be more disappointed by if Star Trek came back as a Ignore all the rumors that we've heard, right? Yeah. If Star Trek came back as a serialized show, mm-hmm. or if it came back as a modern take on the standalone episode, which which would you be more like? Ugh, I don't want. I don't want to watch that. You know, honestly, I don't. I think I would be happy with either one. Okay. Um, the closest that I can I can come to. Uh, actually, you know, I guess it would be probably somewhere in the middle, because. Uh, the closest I can come to an analog for for the way that they handle that stuff now is is uh, Doctor Who. I don't. Do you watch Doctor Who? Uh, very rarely. I, I'm not seriously into it or anything. Well, Doctor Who is is basically a a, uh, a standalone, a serialized show that is all standalone episodes. Yep. If that makes sense, because so, the Doctor uh, character serializes it. Right. Yeah, and and so what they do basically is at least what they've been doing in in the modern era is they kind of have like a a uh, season wide arc, um, where you get little hints dropped along the way, but the episodes you're watching for the most part they kind of handle it differently in every season. But generally the way it's been going is uh, the episode you're watching is sort of a standalone episode that where you'll have. You know, th- he's going up against this evil force this week, but then at the end or, you know, somewhere in the episode, you'll get a little bit of a breadcrumb as to what the larger story is, and they kind of tie that together at the end of the season. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think it works pretty well, because they've done both things where they've gone straight serial, where every episode counts towards the story. They've gone straight uh, episodic, where it's like, you know, where they don't really connect at all, and they've gone somewhere in the middle where... It, uh, where I feel like they've been very successful yep. is where they do um, standalone stories, but each one of them is a two-parter. Sure. Which is I, what they did in the last season. I think that's what they did. And it was really – I thought it was great because it allowed them to really tell a larger story and kind of take their time and pace it out a little bit more. Um, so I, I kind of like that where it was you, – you're getting a – you're getting a standalone story, but it's got a little bit more beef to it, um, and so I, I don't think it's I don't, I, I don't think it's a one or the other thing anymore. I think there's I think there's a way you can kind of hit all the bases and still make it work. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I um that 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 would probably be uh, to pun it the best of both worlds. I guess we just you'd you'd need to you'd need to tie into what makes the show familiar while also pushing it ahead a little bit. And I mean, right. I, I think they, they sort of understand that. I mean, I, I think it's important for the new show. I think it's important for it to be in, I guess what they'd call the prime universe. They, I, I think it's important for the new show yeah. not to be in the JJ universe. Oh yeah. I think so too. Cause I, that, if for the very reason that the only reason that that just, uh, it brings up too many questions, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, um, I think the biggest thing that they're going to have to do, though, is I don't know. It, I think it's if you're going to do a standalone thing, I think that that has to, it has to be built into your story a little bit. Uh, so um, there's another sci-fi show on right now 
That's uh, 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 all DC Comics characters. It's a spinoff of The Flash. Yep. Uh, called Legends of Tomorrow. And it's about a bunch of superhero characters who are uh, get um, recruited by this time traveler who is trying to hunt down this guy named Vandal Savage who's this evil immortal. Sure. And so they're going back at different points in time to stop him, right? But along the way, every episode is kind of its own thing because they're getting in, you know, they they go, they try and stop him in the Old West and they end up getting caught up in some shenanigans there that aren't really related to that or, you know, that kind of thing. And um, it's very similar to Doctor Who in that way, but the difference is uh, there's kind of a que- – there's no nothing stopping them from really completing their mission because let's – if, you know, if they say, oh – this guy's popped up in 1983, and they go back to 1983, and they don't defeat him, and he gets away. Well, then there's nothing stopping them from just going, like, two days into the future and trying it again. Sure, yeah. Whereas in Doctor Who, one of the things is that the TARDIS is kind of messed up yep. and kind of has a mind of its own. So even if he thinks he's going somewhere, it will take him wherever it wants to take him. And... uh that allows it to be a, a lot more have your stories be a lot more standalone. I think anyway, because if 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 you have a, a reason, if you have a, a device in your story that allows it to be serialized, I feel like it doesn't make sense for it to be standalone anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if that makes sense. No, but like I, I, I guess I'm just thinking like like Voyager. Voyager, the ship was kind of broken, so they had that was built into the idea of the show. Yep. And it's like, well, why? And even if you look back at the next generation, it just kind of, if you kind of take a step back, it's like, well, what the hell are they doing out there? Right. <laughs> yeah. Like, are they, yeah. They don't have like a mission, do they? They just, they're just kind of flying around. Yeah. They just kind of fly by the seat of their pants to figure out what the next thing to do would be. That's true. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a big difference between Deep Space Nine and Next Generation. There's no, the universe doesn't seem to have a purpose in Next Generation a lot of the time. Like, think there's right. nothing outside of the ship seems to matter all that much. It's really just what the ship is interacting with matters. Right, right. Yeah, I think that stuff. I I think in the way that people watch and review television now, I think that stuff matters now. Yep. Because if I think it's going to be a lot more difficult to just have we're on the ship and we're just kind of hanging out. And this week we've met these aliens. Like, well, why? I think there's going to be a lot more people who are like, well, what the hell are they doing in space? Why didn't they use their ship to more of an advantage? You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, I watched the Enterprise pilot, which is called Broken Bow, um, mm-hmm. and the the series moved away from it. I think Enterprise has a really, really strong pilot for a thing. It, it sets up a, a lot of information. It sets up the fact that. Uh, the Federation hasn't really expanded. There is no Federation. So it sets up the fact that the humans haven't really expanded. It sets up that there's this tension with the Vulcans because the Vulcans aren't giving humans technology because they don't think they're ready for it. Right. Uh, it sets up that the Vulcans are interacting with other aliens for the humans because they don't think the humans are ready to interact with other species at this point. Uh-huh. So, I mean, it has this whole universe building that's going on like what we were talking about but then the episodes start to sh- uh, start to happen and it's just the ship out in space again encountering random stuff it's like oh right i was more interested in what the actual uh the, like the storyline that was going on about this universe would be yeah it, i mean it's going to be interesting because i i can't think of a when you think of a star trek show you think of a ship out in space just doing stuff you don't think of even <laughs> ironically the, when the even though the conceit of the concept is a ship on a mission, five years or otherwise, uh, there's really no cohesive thread to anything they're doing. They're just sort of there. Yeah, yep. So which I think is is tough to get away with now. Yeah, I, I think so. So that that would that'll be a that'll be a fascinating way that they choose to get around it if they if they do. And uh, I look forward to it next year anyway. But we're going to be back with season six of Next Generation. Which is uh, Realm of Fear. Oh, no. Time Zero Part 2. Sorry. We have, to, we have to finish the Time Zero storyline. I mean, we could just skip it if you want. It's if, fine with me. If we just uh, we do the podcast uh, and just skip that episode and just always wonder what, whatever I'm kinda, happened. I'm kind of disappointed that you haven't worked, worked in um, fatigue more into the show. Where as you go on, it's just like, you know what? I just, I'm not going to do this one. I'm just going to skip this one. <laughs> 
<laughs> Everyone's seen this one. There's no reason to talk about this. There's, there's three podcast episodes left before the end of the series, and I just combined all the movies <laughs> into one stream of consciousness uh, decision. You should have done what they... Uh, uh, there's a podcast I listen to called James Bonding, which is about the James Bond movies. Sure. And they start at either end. So the first episode was Dr. No... And the second episode, at the time when they started, it was Skyfall. Sure. And they would just work their way to the middle. You could have done it that way. And you could have looked forward to ending your seven seasons worth of Star Trek with, like... Uh, would have been, like, I Legacy. Like, yeah. Natasha Yar <laughs> sister episode. What a way to go. That's a great way to go out. <laughs> that would have been that would have been sad. Yeah, but it's, it's, been, it's, been, uh, it's been fun. It's been churning out these episodes. It's been uh, enjoyable. I'm enjoying going through the series, uh, even if I... Sometimes sound like I'm not, but I, I definitely am. It's good. There's only two seasons left. It'll be interesting. We're going to wrap it up with uh, Time Zero Part 2, obviously. But I'm going to come back with podcast about my Season 5 wrap-up. I'll go deep, give out some season-ending awards about Season 5, where I think it ranks, and where it stands in my episode season rankings. Uh, so people are, who are interested in that can tune in for that. But Clay, thank you very much for coming on. No problem. I'll probably have you back for Time Zero Part 2, unfortunately, just because we'll need to keep some kind of continuity. I can't uh, I can't bring in some total, someone who's not. That would have when been it, the other you, way to go about this, I suppose, would bring in <laughs> someone who had not seen Part 1 and make them watch Part 2 and talk about it. When are you doing that? Because I think I'm busy doing anything else. So. This will be uh, 500 years in the past. I'll find your, the recording will be found in a cave on top of a box next to a gun. Oh, I, I do love that the only tension in this episode is due to Mark Twain eavesdropping on a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Re- only revealed because he's vaping so hard yeah. that his, <laughs> his cloud of, of vapor is just uh, all over the place. Oh, it's sad. Anyway, guys, thank you very much for uh, listening. If you enjoyed the content, you're on YouTube. Like in the comments. Appreciate it. Also, hit that poll button. Let me know what you thought of the episode. If you're on iTunes, a rating and review helps get the show out there. Cool. Season 5. I'm happy uh, happy to move it on. I'll miss Season 5. It was a good one. And Clay, I will see you in a couple days with Time Zero Part 2.